right here you can see the, the bluish of the tail and the coppery color of this white fish right beside us here. And then there's another one right there. And those two fish were kind of pushed out when that big bull trout, right at the head there, you can just see the lower white edges of the fins. And that guy was in the tail out cruising around and we just watched him push around the whitefish. And then from there in this run, it's really cool, is over on the edge and at the head are a bunch of cuts. A couple of cuts in the bottom and there's been a couple of rises up top. So it's just a really neat dynamic of interaction between the species. All right, so as we walked up, there was a bull trout in the tail end and a bunch of whitefish, and the cuts are kind of the mid to the head. Last time we were here, I think I only saw one whitefish. Uh, the bulls, not to be seen there. You know, that was early in the year, about a month and a half ago, and they hadn't moved up from the big river down downstream. Now that we're kind of mid end of August, the big bulls have come up. Uh, they'll be spawning here in another three weeks, maybe a month. And because of that, as the water level is lower, the whitefish that were in the system spread out are now stacking into these kinds of pools. The cutthroat that were occupying the little edge pockets, that kind of stuff, they're, they're dropping. But they're also going to stay where their greatest chance of escape cover and overhead cover. You know, overhead cover from birds, escape cover from, well, 30 inch bull sitting right there and also they're going to nose into the current where the food comes by. Instead of just cruising all over, wasting energy, they're just going to sit on the inside edge or along the, uh, the logs or the gravel shelf at the top and just use that current break up, pop, down. So that's what we're facing here. Um, it's really interesting as the seasons go on what species do what and move around in the system and what habitats. But the universal truth is um, anything that's kind of brown means shallower and you're not going to find fish. You pretty much have to, at this time of year, later in the summer through fall, they're starting the stage into their wintering pools. And middle of August is going to be 26 above, you're thinking. You're not thinking winter, but you have to start thinking, hey, there's not enough water and those fish have to be pressed in for overhead cover. So that's where we're at today and these fish will pretty much stay here pretty much now until next May. And it's a hard one to get your head wrapped around, but it's middle of August and they're gonna stay in this pool until the end of the year. So that bull, sorry, that original bull is there. That big bull is a, is a different bull from the tail out. So note that while I talk, cause that one, that one there might be more catchable than that one. So this whitefish does just drop down below me. I know that there's green drakes and a few stone flies still kicking about. The only fly I have readily available in my pocket is a big old stone fly. Or should I say, pardon me, a big old uh, pheasant tail. So I've just got that tied on. I'm naked and I can see this fish right beside me. So I'm just going to lead it by a rod length, let it get to the bottom, and let's see if that white fish comes over and eats that. He's moving on it, moving on it, moving on it, and is he going to eat it? He sure looked at it. Oof, I missed him. <laughs> so, a big pheasant tail nymph can be a stonefly. It can be a green drake. He's coming up to have a look. I don't think he liked that at all. So, that was interesting anyway. Uh, at least it got his attention. You know, just something as big as a giant pheasant tail nymph it can be a golden stone, a little uh, yellow stone, it can be a green drake nymph, it can be a lot of things, or actually a, a, a minnow as well, or a fry of something. Oh, there's two fish just popping out here. So the one I know looked, but I'm not sure which white fish it was. Here he comes so down, here he comes down, and eat it, eat it. Oh, you bugger. <laughs> he came all the way down. It was a late break in charge, so there's still two together. He's active, and is he going to eat it? How about the next one? Oh, he's looking. Oh, I missed him. Yeah, you never know. It's funny with white fish because their noses and mouths are downward. Uh, he kind of cocks like that, but it's not like a white, uh, like a trout where that white of the mouth opens and closes when he has a, your fly in its mouth. This is kind of like a little cock of the head. And, you, and because of those mouths are just like, yep, yep. you don't know if he's got it or not. So I probably just missed time to take. 
so I'm not sure, but I think this is the same bully that was at the back end. I saw that one just kind of cruise around up the sticks, and I'm pretty sure he's just tucked underneath the deepest part of the well underneath that set of sticks there. Now my problem is I know there's a bunch of cutthroat trout above him, and I don't want to induce a, a take on the cutthroat um, on a streamer. It'd just be a particular thing. Yeah, he just he just came off the bottom of foot, so I think he's taking nymphs. But my point is I don't, because there's so few cutthroat sight fishing wise, I don't want to screw up the, the camera work with that. So I'm going to try to feed this streamer into this bull trout and try to do it in a way that I'm not inducing a cutthroat to turn around and come eat my streamer, which is probably going to happen. Uh, but I want to lead it enough so I can sink it to get the bully's attention and see if he wants to come. Now this might this might flag in the water because of the big uh, mallard duck feathers and the deer hair, so I might end up having to add weight to the head of that because right now it's just a tungsten bead. And the flag is basically just kind of like too much material and it'll just kind of flutter up instead of sinking like a rock. And that's got to be five feet deep, so it may be a case that I have to add some splitties, but let's have a go. Ah, oh, bugger, there's a cut right in front of me here. But let's see if that bully wants to come. No, it's not going to do it at all. Not a chance. Not getting down deep enough, no. quick enough, right? No. And I don't want. I mean, it's a big bull, but I don't want to induce uh, a cutthroat. So let's go and let's just go have a look here. I might have to. No, I'm going to add some split shot. My next cast induced the cutthroat I was trying to avoid. I didn't lead the bull high enough nor tight enough to the wood, and the cut came over and ate my streamer. Now I didn't set the hook because I didn't want to risk having the bull trout come over and eat it and I really wanted to catch that cut on a dry fly after catching the bull trout. As I was fishing, what I was trying to avoid almost happened naturally yeah, anyway. Yeah, and then there was a little cut here and he, he got kind of lost in himself and feeding and he went up in the water column and that lower bull trout just came whoop, right on him barely missed him and that big one up there was turning to come and eat that little cut too so my concern is that if I hook up on a smaller cut um, I'm gonna have a visitation from a big bull trout so things are happening um, the fish are moving around and those big bulls are starting to swipe at everything that's swimming through really cool to watch so while I want cuts on the dry fly um, there's a there's a big bull patrolling the bottom and he just swung out big time and actually add a few splitties as well and that way I can get down. Let's see if we can't entice a big bull trout to eat this little streamer. That would be pretty fun. Yeah. Um, because we were just coming up to do some sight fishing and some filming during a green drake or maybe a stonefly hatch or flying ants, um, and we didn't come up to bull trout fish, uh, I, I don't do that to begin with just because the only reason those fish are in these creeks is that they're going to spawn in about a month. Um, and I'm far enough out now that I thought, you know what, there's a big bull trout. He's there and he's chasing these uh, cuts and whitefish around. So. I had exactly one streamer on me today. Uh, that fish easily would have taken a, a big streamer, but because I had a smaller streamer, I, uh, and, and, I, and I said so before I actually cast to that fish, it was like, you know what, if I don't go deep enough, I'm gonna cast in there and a cutthroat's gonna come over and eat my streamer. Well, I took one cast and guess what? The cutthroat came over and ate my streamer. I didn't set the hook because I didn't want that bull trout to chase that cut around. That plus, I think by the time I finished 
you know, finally stop talking, uh, that fish, that cutthroat will be staged again and probably feeding some more. So uh, I have one little streamer, but I also have a couple split shots. And the idea was just pitch it in there, lead it enough along the edge of the structure. There's a whole bunch of sticks that were precluding me from going right at the fish, go figure, um, and just let that drop. And it dropped. And by the time it got to depth, you just saw that big shadow just turn and come down. And that's a fish where big white mouth, close, turn, just like a New Zealand brown set. And after that, the biggest part of that now was, okay, how am I gonna land that fish? And it's just keep your rod low, just like any other big trout in, a bunks, in amongst a bunch of wood, just fold your rod over and in, as it's coming down, you're trying to get it to come downstream, keep your rod low and angled downstream to keep it out of the sticks. And instead of reeling and pumping and pumping and pumping, those fish tend to respond to the pumping. So if you just walk backwards and keep a straight tight line, it'll do what it wants to do and try to force you. But because you're not pumping on it, it doesn't feel the pump, pump, pump. And it says, okay, I gotta go that way. And eventually, and I thought I was gonna lose it at that one point, just where the fish gets down below you, now you want to fold it the other way and try to pull it and fold it. So if, if the fish is across and angled down going into the sticks, flop your rod this way and try to fold it. What I mean by that is the fish will actually pause and either turn up, turn or turn, and that's just to fold the fish and keep it from running into those sticks. And from there, it was just a game of, okay, I fold it away from the sticks the next time it went into the sticks, I was like, ooh, ooh, better fold the rod back and pull it back out the, the which it came. And once I got it out of there, it was just a matter of walking the dog to the tail out, scoop the net and away you go. But that's just called being adaptable. Couple of little splitties and try to pull the bull trout out of there so he doesn't spook the rest of the, of the cutthroat. And hope that afterwards, well, now we should be able to go in there with a the dry fly and a dropper. And hopefully have a go at cuts. Okay, so I just caught that big bully, and well, the cutthroat that ate my streamer before I caught the bully is back, just cruising all over the place. I don't want to catch him on a, on a streamer. Uh, the whole idea is to show dry fly eats, well, so let's go with the dry fly. This guy, I think, is going to come up to some kind of little mayfly, so how about a size 14 um, deer hair winged or merger pattern? Now let's see if he takes that on 4X, 12 foot leader. Hey, hope so. So that was really cool um, to see one bull trout, bunch of white fish, and the cuts and the dynamics of where the fish are in this run this time of year. And it was really cool because, again, um, when I chose to go after the bull trout with the streamer, first cast, a cutthroat came over and ate my streamer. And okay, fair enough. Don't set the hook, let it just kind of wiggle off and go after the bull trout, catch that big bull trout and land it, walk it downstream, in that time, rest the pool. Well, then come back up and the fish that, the, the cutthroat that had eaten my streamer, well, now he's sitting there rising and coming up to the surface and just kind of subsurface eats. Okay, so put on a little size 14, um, what, mayfly merger on 4X and just pitch it in there. And that he was the same fish that ate my streamer and I didn't set the hook on because I wanted the dry fly eat and I hope that that turned out pretty cool because it was so visually 
awesome. Oh, it turned out cool. Okay, cool. I know. <laughs> and so that's why I didn't set the hook on the streamer eat, is because I wanted the dry fly eating this gin clear water, and guess what? So by thinking ahead and going, you know what, we're in back country and these fish aren't all that shy. Yes, they're getting worked. You can see some hook scars, that kind of thing. But you can actually choose your shots. And that's why I didn't set it on the hook set on the streamer because I wanted the, uh, the, the dry fly eat on my little mayfly. So let's go see uh, what might happen up top. I doubt it'll be as, uh, the next eats will be as crisp and clear as that because that was the water. Um, but it's just a joy to be out here and see all this stuff happen. Okay, so there's a white fish there, white fish there, white fish, white fish, white fish. Just above the white fish, a cut just rose. So. We're going to just wait and see if another cut drops back a little bit uh, and, and rises or, uh, or not. The other thing is because we're sighting, we're actually going to stay on this sandbar here because if we walk in the water on the sand, that mud's going to go that way and tip everybody off. So we're just going to kind of walk on the edge of the sand and have a look and just see what we see in hopes that another cut comes and drops out so we can set up on that with the camera and probably go at it again in this low clear water 12 foot long leader uh, 4x to a size 14 uh, hair wing uh, pheasant tail emerger kind of thing rose again up there hey yeah i did let's see if we can see them okay there's an inside current beam i'm just going to try to flip it there see if it comes up no bugger went a little deeper just a little cut let's see if that does it Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, still keep in mind to walk around that inside flat there so you don't stir mud and walk them down around, drop them out of the pool. That way you're not disturbing anybody else. Even if he bolted to that wood, I would just keep that rod tip low and walk him down and around. As he comes along there and see that angle start to swing around that way. And as you get close, that's where you can flip that rod, his head's facing downstream. Now you've got him up top dancing. He's at your mercy at this point. Keep that head on the water, and he can't do anything, and in the net. Simple as. Gorgeous fish. Shall I? Yeah, go for it. Here we go. Awesome. Nice. I know there's, I know there's at least two more cuts in there that were rising, so ah, let's go see what we can do. So I do know that there's a, about a 12, 13 inch darker cut right against the, just out from the logs. And I can see him playing this day. He's moving around, but he hasn't risen. Um, I may have to do a dropper nymph to him. Uh, then there's another one that was cruising around the wood up there. And I know earlier while I was fighting the vulture out, there was another, uh, at least one, maybe two, right at the head drop off. There's a really cool uh, green swell of depth there. So we'll have a look at that. But let's, uh, let's see if we can set up on the camera and show you that fish across the way first. And then it may require a dropper nip because he's just not popping on the surface. But, you know, that's a water temperature thing where early in the day it's still only actually 12 o'clock right now. And that's a temperature thing. Uh, I'm going to get Amelia to pick up that fish up on the camera. I'm going to tie on a dropper nip probably about uh, 24 inches down and probably about a size 14 size 16 tungsten beaded pheasant tail or something like that so a lot of people are probably wondering you know dave they're cutthroat and bull trout what are you what are you doing like why are you changing why are you doing all this different stuff and the only reason is is because i want to catch every single fish i know that's terrible but that's how i operate i think hey if there's a fish uh what do i have to do on that fish to catch that fish um you know, I've gone from uh, dry fly streamer, dry fly, now I'm going dry dropper. And the reason is because each fish is a project unto itself. Uh, you could just come up here and fan cast and just cast, 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 prospect, catch a few fish, move along and cover a lot of water. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, that's just fishing. A lot of people love doing that. I'd say 95% of the people love doing that. And you cover a lot of water and you have a great day hiking and exploring and just having fun. And I'm of the mind that if I see a fish, well, why not? You know, have a challenge of what's that fish doing? You know, it's just uh, just like brown trout in New Zealand, brown trout in Alberta, brown trout anywhere. 
that fish is that fish and that fish is that project. So how are you going to catch that fish? Well, when you combine that with sight fishing and now we got cutthroat trout and each fish in this run is doing something slightly different, well, why not? <laughs> it's just a different way of doing things. So that's why I'm taking the time because it's sight fishing and they're, each fish is doing something distinctly different. So I'm doing distinctly different things for each fish. Just little projects, having fun. Yeah, he's just right there. Perfect. Let's see if this dropper gets him. Here he comes. Got him. I, oh. I, his mouth was open as he came up, and I, I you probably saw I double pumped on the hook set because I, I thought when the mouth first opened that he had it, and I had to stop myself, and then he had it, and I missed it. That, that's the problem sometimes with sight fishing, but. Hey, let's go out uh, get that bigger one just for, uh, ate something. So just do this, give it a man, see if I can drift that in. He looked, that bigger guy looked again. It was the smaller one that actually took my fly originally. So he's having a look, dropping out, no. Okay, so the project fish. Um, just went a little bit deeper with more of a, a tungsten body, a bead, tungsten bead with a uh, copper wrap body kind of PMD nip. And let's just see if depth is the issue. Looking. Yep. Oh, I, have. I saw ah, that dry go down. That's a, again, that's a case of sight fishing where you're looking at your in, uh, your dry fly, but also looking for the fish to come and have a look at your nymph. And I'd just gone from, okay, there's the fish. Okay, it's moving over. And I look back to my dry, and in that split second, he'd already taken my nymph, dry went down, and I missed the hook set. Go to the head bucket and just see if that fish that last rose half an hour ago uh, wants to come and play ball. So that's the new plan. Ready? Yep, absolutely. There he was. Nice. Yeah, that's the one that last rose a long time ago. <laughs> it's like he was just sitting here waiting, saying, Dave, hurry up. Quit playing with the ones down there. They're projects. <laughs> but catch that was the me, one just nosed, just nosed into that drop off, eh? I think nice. it's a nice female here. And love the little beetles, eh? They do. Especially this time of year. Yeah. Got it. Yes. What? Got it. When fishing a stream with whitefish, cutthroat, and bull trout at the peak of summer, you can hop from prime water to prime water and have a great day. Another way is to hone in on each fish as a mini project and switch things up between dries, nymphs, and streamers. This approach translates very well to rainbow and brown trout streams in honing your pace to focus on every individual trout and observe what it's doing and applying the oft simple tactics to catch them. The truth is that there is little that separates a rising brown trout from a cutthroat trout when you target each, having observed their behavior and determined the best approach, cast and tactic.